Hello, welcome back to my deep dive of the Bohemian Animals Tarot. This video is going to be focusing on the minors. If you have not seen the majors video, I just give a little introduction more about the series and get it going a little bit, so you can go ahead and watch that first if you'd like. It's not exactly required watching or anything. Uh, this is probably, I'm going to be a little shorter on each card just because <laughs> the majors was a long video, but also because the minors in this deck are a little bit closer to the traditional Rider Waite Smith in a lot of ways, whereas the major cards um, are very different and they have different interpretations, so there's a lot more to talk about. That, of course, does not mean that the minors are not just as rich and inviting as the majors, just letting you know that I'll probably be going through them a little quicker. So here we have the Ace of Fire, which of course is the Ones suit. I will say right off the bat, I always think it's funny when fantasy species that are reptilian in nature are anthropomorphized and then depicted as having breasts. I just think it's really silly. This doesn't bother me so much in this deck just because that's the style that they use for everything and all of the animals have human bodies where they have human hands and they are definitely human from the neck down so it doesn't bother me so much in this but I'll <clears throat> I'll always get a chuckle I guess out of it but as we can see here what I really like about all of the aces in this deck is that they are being held in the palm of their hand, and the, there are animals that are controlling the elements in some way. And I know in the traditional Rider Waite Smith, there is a reason why the aces are these hands from heaven or whatever, that they're supposed to be coming from some unknown source uh, that's supposed to be like a higher power, sort of like granting the the gift of the pure essence of the element or something like that. I really like having the personal control over it because this to me feels like actually encountering the element for perhaps the first time or encountering the element in its purest form. And so it's a little more relatable, I guess. And I also really like how this snake is almost mesmerized by the fire. You think of a snake charmer, and that's what it looks like. And I totally get that because I get mesmerized by fire all the time. That is how I can get into the most dreamy, meditative, hypnotic state, is by looking at a campfire or looking at a candle flame. I guess I get, I feel like that captures the idea of what it first feels like when you have an idea or when you have a quest that you want to start, or you get that spark, that feels like a very hypnotic thing to me, so I think it's a, a very appropriate depiction. Next we have the Two of Wands, or the Two of Fire. There's a tiger here who is holding a little turtle, and what I really like about this one is the fact that the tiger is just on the outside of this wall, and the way that I see this is that Within the wall, it feels very much like a homestead. This tiger seems very comfortable and happy and has this elaborate embroidered uh, skirt or dress. And so it's not like the tiger is missing anything. You have this beautiful home by the seaside that many people would want to establish. It's almost like the Ten of Cups, but, um, <laughs> you know, like the tiger has already achieved this Ten of Cups. But then something is calling them to step outside of it. And it's not necessarily out of a want for anything specific or a need for anything specific. It's just out of curiosity and this draw to step outside. And so I see this tiger as taking a moment to look out towards the ocean. Some people, and, and in some cards, the Two of Fire is about indecisiveness, and that's definitely... You know, there are definitely some cards that emphasize that more than others. This particular depiction, I feel like, is more about viewing the majesty of the ocean and just taking that moment where you're just taking a breath and you're taking it all in and you're not quite ready to act because you just need to take a breath and really appreciate it all first. 
It reminds me of the phrase, curiosity killed the cat. And if you don't know, that phrase, the complete phrase actually goes, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. And I love, for, <laughs> there are so many phrases like that where the real phrase just is the exact opposite meaning of the commonly used phrase. Another is that the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. That is the full version of blood is thicker than water. And of course, saying blood is thicker than water, you're saying that family is more important, you know, the family that you're born into is more important than the family that you choose. But the full rendition of it is that the blood of the covenant, the one, the people in which you willingly choose to enter a relationship with is thicker than the water of the womb or, or just who you were born into. So anyway, I really love this idea of, um... It's all again, it's almost like a hypnotic thing of just being pulled toward the ocean, pulled in with the tide and just really needing to you know, being stirred in a way that's hard to describe, just being stirred to move even when you have everything. Next, we have the 3 of wands, and here we have a kangaroo who is in the middle of the desert, presumably an outback desert. The three I've always had difficulty with because it feels so melancholic. And I guess that's appropriate when you sort of match it with the three of swords. A lot of people, or a lot of renditions of the card, I should stop saying people, but you know what I mean. A lot of renditions of the card, again, seem to be a little more about bringing the ship in and sort of having a reward from what you set out to do during during the two. I I like the concept more of the three as that pause and that sort of worry and anxiety of realizing, oh shit, what did I just do? <laughs> you know, you stepped out, you took a risk, you made a big investment, you made a big change, and now you are just sitting there and hoping that it's going to pay off and it's this endless waiting. It's like it's like waiting for a package. I <laughs> Maybe this is too um tarot specific or anything, but you know, it's like when when I'm waiting for a new tarot deck and I've been so excited about it and it to, I really build myself up and I really, really think about if I'm going to want a tarot deck. So by the time I actually buy one, I know that I love it and I really want it. And then as soon as I have to wait for it, it's I just get so antsy about it. I'm checking the mail constantly. Yesterday was Sunday for me when I'm as of when I'm recording this. And so it's, you know, it was so much to feel like I couldn't go and check the mailbox. You know, I could, but there'd be nothing in there. That's sort of what I feel about the Three of Fire, is it's that it's not necessarily anxiety. I mean, it can be anxiety, but it's not always anxiety about how it will turn out. It's just this sort of, it's this empty feeling. And that's what I like about this card, is this it feels emptier, and it feels more vast. And as opposed to the ocean, which to, always to me feels very full and happy and lappy and <laughs> all of these things... I like the idea of the desert because it is empty. And be, I mean, a true desert is not empty, but it feels empty. I really like that they've chosen to focus more on the waiting than on the actual moment where you see the ship in the horizon and then you know it's all going to pay off. Here we have the Four of Wands. I love the Four of Wands. It's one of my favorite cards, and I love raccoons. The Four of Wands... It's often a wedding card, and you kind of get that here. But what I really like about it is all of the fruit in this card. There's fruit. Of course, there's this very big overflowing fruit basket. And maybe I'm crazy and these are just leaves, but to me, I see, I see pears up here. And pears and pear trees symbolically are very much about um, love and family and and sort and a sweet love i guess and i really feel the abundance it's not just the celebration aspect but the fact that they have all this fruit here you really feel the abundance of it you feel the moment when the 3 paid off in the 4 where now you know you made 
this effort. You had everything that you needed, but you went out in search of the unknown. You have the three where you're waiting and there's that that just moment of suspension. And now here is the conclusion of it, where it feels now that it's actually paid off and you have the... Um, you have you have the abundant payoff. It's not and and that is what you are celebrating. It's not just about celebration of an event. You know, it feels like celebration of your um, intrepid, risky ideal. Here is the five, and these are ostriches, I believe. <laughs> and what I really like about this one is that these ostriches all seem very young. And that's the thing about the five, is that in comparison to the five of swords, both of those have a sort of fighting uh, aspect to them. But what I like about this one is it's more of a childlike competition and or or a youthful competition. It's like, it reminds me of when I was a kid... Um, Am I going to sound weird? When I was a kid, my friends and I liked to play with sticks and pretend that they were swords. And so we'd just run around and we'd just hit... We wouldn't hit each other with the sticks, we'd just hit the sticks together. And that's kind of what it feels like, because it doesn't really feel like they're hitting each other. Because if they were trying to hit each other, then this ostrich, for example, would be holding it further down. So you'd actually have an aim at the head. It feels like they're just hitting the sticks together for the sake of play fighting. Um, by the way, the end of my story is that we did this at school, and of course the kid, the teachers all thought that it was way too violent, and so they said, no more sticks. And so then we go out and we get a bunch of wiffle ball bats, just those plastic hollow baseball bats, which you couldn't hurt someone with even if you wanted to, and we started hitting those together. And then they were like, no, you can't do that either. And so <laughs> eventually, you know, we tried these different things and they, we ended up getting all of them taken away. And so then we're just like, fine, okay, they don't want us to do this, we're just going to trade Pokemon cards, we're just not going to go run around. And then they say, no more Pokemon cards, you guys need to go run around and play. And I just always thought that was so funny, is that we were trying to play. We were trying to run around and have fun and get exercise, and then you took that away. <laughs> the point is, <laughs> I definitely get this childlike energy. I like how they are depicted sort of younger. And you can kind of see that in the sense that they don't have their full plumage. I guess ostriches don't really have plumage on their head, but... Um, I don't know. I guess the bodies are smaller. They seem more like adolescent bodies or ch or children's bodies, maybe like 12 years old. So I like that idea of a childlike friendly play fighting as opposed to an actual fight fight. Here we have the six of wands. I did, all of the wands are so great in this deck. I love lions very much. And what I like about this card is that in the background, they are cats. They are sort of, they look like domestic cats. And then the person who went out on the adventure has now returned as a lion. So I almost see it as like, the lion is going out and earning their mane, <laughs> in a way. And they've earned their mane, and that is what is being celebrated here, is coming back and being welcomed as a hero of sorts, who is now... um done something great or or brought something great back or brought back you know and and that can be knowledge it doesn't have to be something physical just <laughs> to make that clear so you have the cats who are who are celebrating the um the intrepid spirit and the wisdom and just the experience of one of their own a cat who has now returned as a lion and I just think that sums it up very well. I really, I really like this card. I, I gotta keep moving here, but I just, I keep wanting to stare at this line. It's so cute. It's, okay, I'll turn over the card. Okay. Seven of Wands. This one, I love how they designed this tunic, how you have the little flames lapping up at the bottom, because um, that to me feels like how they are interpreting these other wands and these other other battlers. What I really like about the bottom here specifically is that 
the fact that the flames on the tunic or you know the flame patterns are sort of lapping up at this warthog and she is so she's protective and you can see that the the moment the place where um she's holding the wand she's holding it in such a way that the majority of the flames and at least the wild flames are coming up from below and so you can almost see like she's protecting her heart which would be there and she's trying to prevent the flames from coming up and reaching her heart and her head and overwhelming her i just i really like the integration of that and how it feels like she is protecting herself from the the destruction of this this fire next we have eight which is an antelope i think this is a sable antelope if that makes a difference what i think is interesting about this card and i can't totally decide if it's something that i like or dislike or really understand or don't understand but what i like about it is that it's a little ambiguous as to whether the antelope is the one casting the wands out like throwing them you can almost see that as a s sort of sweeping throwing motion where if you imagine the antelope had been holding all of them and then boom i'm trying not to hit my candles here <laughs> but you know has thrown them all out and now they are making that swift action or if you see it the other way where you see the wands as incoming as someone else having thrown them and the antelope now is willing to accept them and is unafraid of them and is opening their arm out in more of a receptive state i guess i don't have to like it or dislike it it's just interesting and i think that it lends a new perspective to the eight of wands in general i don't i really like the concept of the eight of wands this sort of swift action and and very focused decision making but i've never really liked just the the rather pip-ish wands in the Rider Waite Smith because I just feel like it's one of those cards that you kind of have to memorize the meaning. So what I like about this is that there are multiple ways of interpreting it and um it just lends a little more depth to this card. So I really enjoy that. I guess I won't linger too long. Here we have the nine and we have an ant here. The choice of the ant speaks very well to this idea of defending not just for your sake, but for your home and your your um, colony and everything that you love. Where you have you have the ants. Ants never work individually, and they would not work very well individually. But they are able to accomplish great things as a colony. And so you wonder. It seems like an ant would be very defensive of not just themselves but other people and that can be taken at face value in a sense of maybe you are being defensive of other people that you care very much about and that's of course a perfectly good interpretation i think you can also defend it in a way that to an ant a colony is everything a colony is their entire world and so in feeling the need to defend the colony you are defending your world you're defending your world view you are defending everything that you've ever known i can understand the vigilance and the intensity then of feeling the need to defend all that and it feels a less it feels less like an unnecessary defense it is it is a draining defense and it's no wonder it's so stressful i guess because when you are defending everything that you've ever known and loved like that's just it's a much greater intensity i guess <laughs> which i appreciate for the nine of wands and here we have the ten what i like about this again is the fact that you could sort of interpret it in two ways where you could see this as an unnecessary burden and it's very difficult to carry all of this stuff for this little baby elephant but at the same time the elephant seems rather close to the tents here and it seems like it wouldn't 
you know, the elephant could choose to set some down and come back for them later, or just carry them all in one go, and um, either way, it wouldn't be that great of a burden. It reminds me of trying to carry all of the groceries from your car <laughs> in in one go. <laughs> where you, you know, Have you ever done that, where you're trying to stack up groceries and, you know, hang all of them off of your arm in a certain way and then grabbing them and just trying to carry all of it in one go. And it's not because you need to. It's not because you couldn't go and make multiple trips. It's almost a pride thing. And I guess that's what I get about this, is that the elephant is taking on this burden out of a sense of pride and out of a sense of, I can do this, and I will do this, and I don't care if it's stupid, and I don't care if there are easy ways to, easier ways to carry all this. I'm going to do this because I can. And you have that sort of stubbornness and that resoluteness that I really like, because sometimes we are saddled with burdens that we cannot shirk, but I think in the wand suit specifically, a lot of it has to do with our own ambition and our own desire to um, to discover or our own desire to take things on. And so this, I think, speaks well to that of this elephant is, is carrying all this because they want to, not because they can't set them down. Here we've got the page. I'm going to go relatively quickly through the court cards, I think. The um, meerkat here, I think, is a good choice because you think of the meerkat kind of popping up from their burrows and you have a, a sentry. Uh, prairie dogs are like this, too, where, you know, they stick their heads up and they have one of them looking out around while all the others are working. And so you imagine this one as being the one who is looking up around. But it's not a focus on one place. It's a focus on everything. You want to see everything and you want to make sure that from all directions, you know what's happening. And I just think that is sort of a good idea of the Page of Fire of being of looking around in a bunch of different directions and not necessarily having a pull towards one thing in particular, because that's sort of what the knight does. The knight has decided what the quest is and is a little more steadfast, but the page has that more childlike curiosity about everything. So I like the meerkat for that. Here we have the knight who is a goose riding a goose. And <laughs> it's like, it seems, it seems to be a more domestic farm animal goose riding a Canada goose. And it's funny to see Canada Goose in the desert here. <laughs> it's just kind of a silly one. But I think, you know, as far as the night of fire goes, as long as everything's in kind of very directional, you know, they are very resolute, they know what they're doing, that, that speaks well enough to me. It's pretty simple. Yeah, I guess I don't have much to say on this one. Here we have the queen. I believe this is the only... Oh no, I'm wrong. I was about to say that this is the only uh, fictional animal in this deck, but there's also the unicorn in the star card. But I think those two are the only fictional animals in this deck. And the thing I like about the Queen of Wands, and the thing that I tend to look for, is a balance between passion and happiness and a sort of intensity. Because um, the Queen of Wands is associated with Leo, and I generally, and my mom was a Leo, and so a lot of this is going to be cover, colored by the perception of my mom. They know their own strength. It's not that they don't know their own strength. They know their own strength perfectly well, but they don't always realize how it can affect other people. And I think someone who has a lot of passion and a lot of uh, fire-like <laughs> spirit, I guess, can tend to fall into that trap a little bit of allowing their, you know, allow, allowing their fire to, to dominate other people or to, or to control other people. And I think a lot of times, you know, it's, it's not intentional. It's just this sort of, they're so comfortable with fire, and they're so comfortable with this confidence and this 
um, uh, authoritative energy that they don't always realize when it is making other people uncomfortable. And that, I think, works very well for a dragon in general because you have this idea of they are very powerful beings and they're very intelligent and they they kind of do their own thing and they don't always care if they have to burn down a village to do it or they don't always think of it as being a big deal if they have to burn down a village. Um, I think the sort of intensity of the gaze of this dragon works very well for that. And the black cat has a very intense gaze. And you have these two little sort of minion dragons it almost reminds me of, which I think can speak well to the controlling force in some cases, or as a more positive light, it speaks well to this, the magnetism that uh, Leo, who uses their powers for good, or a Queen of Wands type who uses their powers for good, can command this, uh, you know, through their passion and their fire and their energy, people are inspired by them and they want to follow them. So I think it's, I, I like this depiction of it. I think it's a very good depiction. And here we have the king, who is a salamander, and I think it's funny because you think of a, I think a salamander is basically like a tiny dragon, in sort of symbolically. <laughs> you have a lot of the same associations with this magical power and this fiery uh, element, I guess, <laughs> that is associated with the salamander, and so. I sort of feel like the salamander is like a more controlled version of the dragon, where a salamander is so small, and a salamander... You're probably not going to run into a lot of trouble with the salamander, and a salamander is probably not going to try to assert its dominance in a very strong way, but it still has a lot of the associations of being magically powerful, and it's almost like it's so... It's just better at, at recognizing... It's at, at at positioning its relationship with other people. Does that make sense? No, I don't know. Anyway, now we're into the cups suit, and this is the ace. I <laughs> I kind of hated this card at first, but it has really grown on me because what I like about it is the I like how the panther is behind the cup. It is offering you the cup, but it's also hiding behind it in some way. And that, to me, speaks a lot about hidden realms and how, for me personally, emotions are not always clear, and they're not always as easy to understand as other things. Something about the way that this, um, the, com the composition is, where the cup is so front and center and it's right in front of it. It also speaks to me sort of about wearing your emotions on your sleeve, wearing your heart on your sleeve, and like, you want to know me, this is as much a part of me as everything else. I can, I can give you this, here's what I'm showing you. My emotions speak to who I am in a way that we're maybe not used to recognizing. So I just, I really like how the cup is very front and center, and I like the sort of mysterious um, selection of the Black Panther here. Here we have the two, and it is a pair of doves, and that's about it. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's a very classical uh, interpretation of the two, I think, and very much about this um, coming together. You know, I think it speaks for itself. Here's the three. These are mongooses, and I think that's kind of a funny animal to choose. It's not necessarily something you'd immediately think of. Um, but you think of the mongoose as they take on snakes. I think they eat snakes. I don't totally remember. But they are completely brave. They are willing to get into a fight. They are willing to take on snakes. And they are confident. 
And I sort of like that for the, the, um, three of cups. They're almost celebrating their mutual assuredness. They are so happy. They're so carefree. And it, okay, that's what it speaks to that. It's sort of like when you have such great self-confidence, it becomes easy to interact with other people. It becomes easy to, um, to share with other people. It becomes easy to celebrate because you are so self-assured that, you know, if anything goes wrong, I can handle it. Or if I need to take a break, then I'll know when I need to do that. And so you can really let yourself go. You can let go of your worries and your anxieties and all of that and just really be in this moment and really enjoy the celebration when you aren't having to worry about running for your life. When, you know, even if a snake comes up, you can just go and bite its fucking head off. You know what I mean? Here we have the Four of Cups. And I will say that in general, I think the Four of, Cl the Four of Cups is the ugliest card in the deck. And this is in the Rider Waite Smith or in the original, you know, the Pixie artwork, but also a lot of renditions that um, are derived from RWS are really ugly. And I, <laughs> I sort of refer to it as the fart cloud because that's what it looks like. It looks like you've got this fart cloud that's coming down and handing you a cup. So the wings, I think, are a nice way of getting it in the same meaning without making it look really bad. Uh, <laughs> what I like about this card is that each of the cups are different. And I like that because it seems like the, um, the koala here is not satisfied with any of them. And they're sort of trying a bunch of different things. And it's like, well, maybe I'd like this... Um, this smoother ivory one, eh, I don't like that one. Maybe I'd like this silver one, eh, maybe I want it a little fancier. I've got this gold with the engraving. It's like, eh, just not really feeling any of them for one reason or another. And it's almost like they're just tired. They're just exhausted of cup shopping. Have you ever, <laughs> have you ever been like to Ikea or something and you're going through and you're looking at all of these different um, all these different pieces of furniture. I really like going to Ikea, but at some point it just becomes so exhausting where you have been looking at so many different pieces of particle board and, um, brushed steel that you are just, it, it is overwhelming. It is exhausting. You're just, I am so sick of this. And that's what it feels like. It feels like this koala has been trying so hard to find the cup that is right for them. They want one that is perfect, and perhaps they're idealizing it to a certain extent. Perhaps they just can't really make a decision on, well, this one's good enough. They all function as cups. Maybe I need to let go of my ideal. And I think the cups in general can be a very idealistic um, suit. And, it, and sort of when you have a lot of your emotions wrapped up in something, then it's easy to get focused on a, a particular ideal uh, situation. Anyway, so I, 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 I just get that. I get the apathy. I get the exhaustion. To me, apathy is really about exhaustion, because if you are feeling energetic, then you are more willing to put up with the difficulties of... Um, of persevering when, when you are out of energy and when you have that exhaustion, that's really where the apathy comes from. And something about just the fact that all the cups are different, that just, it just rings true to that for me. Here we have the five of cups and this is, what is this? Some sort of weasel a muscle tid of some kind. And I like this card because I think it speaks very well to loss. The very bright blood red stands out to me very well. I think that the Rider Waite Smith, see, I don't even remember. I think the Rider Waite Smith has red in the, uh, in the cups that are being spilled over. I'm actually just going to look real quick. 
Yes, Rider Waite, Rider Waite Smith has the two spilled cups. They have spilled out some sort of blood red liquid. But it just the fact that I even had to look it up that I can't remember, it means that it doesn't especially stand out in the Rider Waite Smith. This draws your attention immediately, and I like how it's on the very bottom of the card, so it really makes you look down, and this is the most saturated and the and the um most eye catching part of the whole card, and so you are following this weasel's gaze down to these <laughs> cups, and you're almost forced to focus on these, which I think is so brilliant because that is what the whole purpose of the card is about that is what this figure is feeling of you are you are drawn to having to look at this and to and to feel it in some way and to mourn it um it really looks like blood to me as opposed to wine or something and i just i really like i really like that because i think it expresses the severity of the situation and the intensity of the loss a little better the the big morning cloak in what otherwise seems to be a rather um temperate day it's a sunny day and you you're donning this big heavy cloak because that's what depression feels like it's not they're not wearing the cloak out of a practicality out of a out of a um you know it's cold out so i'm going to wear a big coat they're wearing this coat out of a necessity because that is what it feels like when you have depression or when you are experiencing loss it feels like everything is just on top of you it feels like you are being physically dragged down so i really like that and of course you still get the sort of classical you can you can see it in a more positive light i suppose of well you still have the two cups here of of the the things that you still have and you have the rather sunny day and you can see it as well things aren't as bad as they seem but I appreciate how it does, um, it at least allows you to focus on the experience of the loss. Here we have the Six of Cups. The Six of Cups is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite cards in, in most decks, and... I'll have to talk about that at some point because it's probably too involved to get into right now. But anyway, I really love these are little otters. I always thought they were beavers just because the tails were so dark, but I was reading the guidebook the other day and it said that they're otters. Something I kind of like about this one is it almost looks like the one who's offering the flowers is younger. You could see them both as children, but I think you could also almost see this otter on the left as being an adolescent in some way and this is being a parent. I really like that because I feel like you can extrapolate this idea of offering kindness regardless of age. It's not just a longing for um, childhood times when things seemed seemed easier or seemed sweeter or, or, or you know, whatever you want to see that as. It's about offering kindness to yourself always and to people who are deserving of it regardless of how old you are or how old they are you can offer kindness to your younger self and when you are beating yourself up you can receive kindness from your younger self i a lot of times i look at how I felt when I was a teenager, how I felt when I was a child, and I look at where I am today, and I'm just thinking, my kid self would be so amazed by everything that's happened, and so amazed at where I, where I am now. Okay, next we have the Seven of Cups. In general, I don't really like the Seven of Cups. I feel like it's kind of a boring card and it's one of those things where I don't actually work with the image all that much I'm just kind of thinking okay yeah seven of cups has to do with choice whatever and I just kind of go off of this like memorized keyword meaning um I guess what I like about this one it is rather traditional uh Rider Waite Smith but what I like about it is that 
it's not necessarily immediately clear which is the good choice. I feel like that kind of happens in other decks where it's like, oh yeah, well it's supposed it's supposed to be a hard choice, but obviously you're not supposed to choose the riches one. You're supposed to choose this other one. And what I like about this one is it's a little they all look pretty good except for that one. <laughs> you know, that's sort of like the obvious don't choose. But in general, like it's a little harder to choose because you've got this just beautiful abundance of grapes. And it's like, well, should I choose should I choose that one? Should I choose this abundance? Should I choose this beautiful um this beautiful home, this beautiful tower structure? Should I choose these riches? Um I just think in general it's a little it's a it's a nice little depiction that's a little um less obvious than it can often be. Here we have the Eight of Cups, and you have the Bluebird here, who is... Um, what I like about the Bluebird is that it is a songbird. It is one that's generally associated with happiness. You've got the Bluebird of happiness or the Bluebird of friendliness, if you're a They Might Be Giants fan. Um, <laughs> you have... Um, a very happy character, and it's one that you can actually see their full figure, and it doesn't look so um, skulky as <laughs> or intense as the figure in a lot of traditional Rider Waite Smith. And so it just feels like the Bluebird is very self assured and very happy with the decision of, like, yeah, I'm gonna leave these cups, and that's good, and I know that's the right decision, and that's what I wanna do. So it just it feels a little more positive, I guess, than a lot of Eight of Cups, which is kinda nice. Here we have the Nine of Cups, and I see this as sort of an intensity of here, here is everything that I've done. Here is everything that I've been through. You have all these cups representing all of your emotional experiences that you've gone through in the suit up to this point. You've had apathy, you've had loss, you've had, you know, sadness and happiness, you've had a lot of intense emotions that you've all collected up, you've got a lot of intense experiences, and now it's being presented almost like a trophy room, almost like here are all of my experiences, here are all of my emotions, look at them, here they are, <laughs> and 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 just putting them all out there. What I like about this, this uh, elk or deer or whatever it is in particular is that it doesn't necessarily seem happy about it. I know in the original Rider Waite Smith the figure is smiling, but this one has just a sort of um intensity or um plainness about it of here is everything I've got. Look at it. This is who I am. This is everything. And you can take it or leave it, but I can't give it up. It's it's a part of who I am. And what I really like about that is I think it flows very well then into the Ten of Cups, which is about this sort of everlasting happiness and this um, this contentment with another person or multiple people. And so I just think that flows very well. It's almost like you're presenting yourself in your entirety, in your wholeness. You are being open, you are being honest, and you are being emotionally um, a bit accessible and emotionally vulnerable in a way of of presenting all these things. They're not behind glass or anything. They're just there. And so then that, I think, flows very well into that is what leads to this ultimate, more lasting emotional happiness that involves other people is this this openness with yourself and this, and this um, being plain about your emotions. And this is just a nice, cute little <laughs> domestic um, card, rather traditional don't have much to say on that one. All right, I better hustle it up here because this is getting pretty long and we're only two, through two suits here. I just can't help it. There's so many cool things. Oh god, we're not even two, through two suits. I forgot about this. <laughs> okay, Page of Water. Um, really, really nice selection because dolphins are very playful, but it's also a very relaxed um, setting, sitting in the lotus. It just feels like a nice a nice balance of 
of emotions and the selection of the dolphin just feels like it's it's still a little naive or childlike it it doesn't have especially a lot of control over the emotions although it may it may try <laughs> it's almost like the piece is sort of a temporary thing here we have the knight I think it's kind of funny how each of the knights are riding an animal version of themselves. <laughs> Here we have a pelican, and, you know, it's good. We have the fish carried on. They, there's a fish in the cup here, and now there's the fish on the, um, on the robes, or, what is that called? Tunic? What, whatever it's called. I think it's fine. It's... It's interesting that the pelican is going off of the land into the water and is and is sort of following uh, emotions in a way and is allowing themselves to be sort of drifted by the tides. They're not flying. They could fly, but no, they're just sort of sitting in the water and they're allowing the allowing the tides to guide them in a way. That seems that seems pretty reminiscent of the Knight of Cups. Here we have the Queen of Cups. I love this queen. I love seals. They are so great. And what I really like about this is um, this seal just seems so kind and so accessible and not necessarily in an overtly cheerful way, but just in a very nurturing way and a very friendly way. I could be swimming in this ocean. I could be swimming among all of these emotions. I could, I could be diving really deep and any time that I'm feeling overwhelmed, I can come up I can hang on to the edge of this little island, um, you know, rest rest my arms on it and just hang out with this seal and take a little break, take a little sit in the sun. Um, and it's sort of nice because it's like, it feels like it's warming when you need it to be because you've got the sun and the rays and it's also cooling when you need it to be because you have the water. Um, so I just, I just really like the seal. I could totally hang out with a seal. <laughs> Is that weird? <laughs> I can hang out with a seal. And here you have the king, which is a frog in a similar position. The frogs always sort of remind me of like the fairy tale of the frog with the golden ball in its mouth. And I just, I, I guess I kind of see that. It feels like it may seem like a rather simple animal at first, but it has it carries a lot of wisdom within it and it carries these pearls of knowledge so that when it opens its mouth it's got this it's got this golden ball and i just so i like the selection of the frog and i also like the whale in the background because you might have thought of the king you might have thought that the whale would be more appropriate for the king but the simplicity of the frog i feel like just speaks to the accessibility the emotional accessibility of all of the, um, all of the cup court cards. All right, now we're moving on to air. <laughs> I am sorry that this is so incredibly long, but I am, I'm just, what can I say? I can get a little rambly and I, I'm enjoying myself. I hope you're sort of enjoying it. If you're this far along, then you're probably enjoying it a little, right? <laughs> um, ace here, we have a crow. The thing that I like about this is that the expression of the crow looks very self-assured and very sharp and very cutting and very knowledgeable and you can sort of see that um, the sword is not being gripped tightly it's being held and it's floating in a way it's being held in the palm of their hand I guess it just feels like it commands a sort of mastery of the of the sword which may seem kind of funny for the ace but it's i guess you i see this crow as more of a mentor of like this this mastering this mastery of the sword and this mastery of knowledge of like here's what you can do and here's what you want to do and here's what can happen when you have such perfect mental clarity that you can see through everything you can do these amazing things and you can hold a sword upright in your palm without touching it or whatever you want to whatever you want to say 
here we have the Two of Swords, and this is a Wolverine. And what stands out to me about this is that the animal Wolverine is on the dress of the anthropomorphized Wolverine. And what I kind of like about that is that Again, if you think of the more human-like as being a little bit more conscious, then this is sort of speaking more to that, nope, I don't want to be conscious. This is what I want to be. This is who I am. I just want to be this animal wolverine, not thinking about not anything, not worrying about anything, just whatever. Like, this is sort of what is going on in this this scene on the dress is what is going on in this Wolverine's mind, and that's what I see it as. Here is the Three of Swords, and I really like this one. Um, I'm Year of the Rat. I love rats very much, and I really like them symbolically. What I like about rats in this case, it, I think it speaks to their simplicity and their vulnerability as a prey animal. And you can see here, the hilts of the swords are owls, or owl people, because it looks like they have breasts also. <laughs> so it, I think it speaks very well to what it feels like being attacked in a way, or it feels like being eaten, or it feels like um, you're vulnerable in the way that a prey animal is vulnerable, and that's sort of what the, um, that's what hurts. That's, that's, that's where the hurt comes from, is being taken advantage of. Your vulnerability is being taken advantage of your your naivety in some ways is being taken advantage of. So I really like the, I like the combination. I like the parallel of the, the predator prey. Here we have the four of swords and this is a lynx and up here to me, I think this looks a little more like a domestic cat, but I suppose you could also say it as a lynx because it, of the little face um, mutton chops or whatever that the lynx has. What I kind of like about this one and sort of the vibe that I get is that this does not look like a very comfortable resting place. You know what I mean? And I guess the four in general, <laughs> it never looks very comfortable. In a lot of fours, I feel like the figure when they're lying down looks dead. It looks like a statue in some ways. I like how this looks more like an alive figure, an alive animal, but it also doesn't look especially comfortable. It looks dramatic. It looks like, oh, I am lying here and I, I can't get up. I, it's, this is, <laughs> this is my tomb. This is my bed. I feel like I've already died. Um, but I like how it still depicts this sort of, it, it looks a little more alive. It, the, you know, the blanket is purple, which is the color of spiritual awakening. And so you can sort of, or, or enlightenment in some way. And so you can sort of see that as, well, even if it doesn't feel like a restful rest, just the sheer fact of taking that time out to rest is what will, um, rejuvenate you and what will help you ultimately gain clarity on the situation. I don't know. I just like that. Here we have the Five of Swords and we have a hen here. I think it's a pretty classical interpretation. I love the hen's face here of this ra this intensity of, um, you know, if you've ever gotten in a scrap with any sort of barnyard animal, <laughs> you will totally know what this face is. It is this intensity. I mean, I'm laughing, but there are a lot of people who are genuinely afraid of chickens or of um, barnyard animals because, you know, as a kid, they didn't know any better. They try to interact with it or something and it attacks them. Like if you've ever seen a goose during uh, egg season, it's like, Jesus Christ! This is real intensity. And so I guess it almost 
it makes sense. It's like this willingness to defend and protect and fight for what this hen uh, wants. And if this hen wants to be left alone, and if this hen wants all these swords, then, then this hen's gonna get it, and you better not fuck with them. Here for the Six of Swords, you have cats, and I feel like it's a rather traditional depiction of the Six. You have the boat, you have the fairy, you have all of these things. I don't actually have a whole lot to say on this particular rendition. I just did a whole zine on the Six of Swords that goes into a lot of depth about it, so you'd think I'd have more to say on it, but I just feel like I've exhausted everything, you know what I mean? I guess one thing I kind of like is how one of these swords is sort of set off from the other one, from from the other uh, five, and it feels almost like a guiding principle or something that you'd hang a flag from or something that that you are going towards. I mean, ultimately, you'll you'll be landing on these shores back here, but it's almost like one particular piece of knowledge or one particular lived experience just stands out above all the other ones. And you could see that as a good experience or a bad experience, but that is the one that is ultimately bringing your focus. And it's sort of like when you integrate all of these experiences together, and when they're all sort of on an equal ground and you have an equally good understanding of all of them and you don't feel the need to focus on one specifically, perhaps that's where you can gain your clarity. I don't know, just <laughs> I feel like I'm just trying to say something about this. Here we have the seven. And again, I think it's pretty traditional. It's not that <laughs> there's not a whole lot to say on this one. I do think it's funny, this, I think this is a blue jay, it looks like a blue jay to me, and blue jays are huge jerks, and they totally go and steal from other birds, if you've ever seen this. If you've ever tried to feed birds out in your yard or something, and you have a blue jay in the neighborhood, you will not get any other birds. You get the blue jay, and that is it. <laughs> and that, so that's just what it kind of reminds me of growing up, when my dad used to like to spread a whole bunch of seeds out on the table that we had on our little balcony. And, um, we had all these other birds for a while, and then at some point a blue jay moved into the neighborhood, and then we stopped getting all the other birds. Um, so, you know, I guess that's just a little personal anecdote. If I can see the blue jay as being a, a rather selfish bird in some ways. Um, I actually have a lot to say on the Seven of Swords as this idea of, you know, once you've landed on this other shore, you have a sort of panic of wanting to make sure that you can get as many swords before they get taken away by the hen again, or, you know, by whatever figure you have in the Five of Swords. So I'm not saying that Seven of Swords is automatically the dick move card. <laughs> it's just that the Blue Jay, to me, is automatically the dick move bird. <laughs> Here we have the Eight, and again, it... um speaks very well to the sort of classic interpretation where, yeah, you have the the human arms feel bound, but the wings are free, and so, of course, this bird could just start flying, and it doesn't matter if the arms are tied up in that way. Um, this is an albatross, I think, which is also interesting because you think of the albatross as sort of an animal of burden, um, like having the albatross chained to your neck and dragging you down because it's such a huge bird and a huge weight. Um, so the albatross is a burden. I, I guess I see that as, you know, this is a burdened animal or a burdened person, y you know, and, and perhaps that's where you can also think of the animal parts are free, but the human parts are feeling burdened. And so that can sort of talk about the trappings of the mind, because we think of, again, the mind as being a human consciousness, a human intelligence, a human awareness. Um, so it's sort of like by starting to trust your inner uh, instinct and your sort of animal brain in some ways and just your ability to persevere through life as, you know, that's sort of what an animal thing is, that is how you can ultimately free yourself or ultimately take off from this little desert island. Here we have the Nine of Swords and... I think it's a pretty classical depiction. 
I'll just talk a little about the selection of animal. This is a gecko, and when you think of a gecko, or at least when I think of a gecko, I think of them <coughs> I think of them dropping their tail. Um like you know how a gecko can 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 let go of its own tail in order to get away from a predator or something? And that to me speaks again of like a power that this animal has that it's sort of forgetting about, where its human side is overwhelmed with this worry and anxiety of this idea of what am I going to do without without realizing that the animal side already has a power, already has this capability of getting out of a bad situation. And that if worst comes to worst, if their fears come true, then the they have the capacity to drop their tail and to get away. If they they have these emergency measures in place and they have the power to protect themselves. And that is something that clearly this gecko has sort of has sort of forgotten, is being overwhelmed by the rather human side of consciousness, the rather human anxiety. And here we have the Ten of Swords. I think that the goat makes a lot of sense as sort of the sacrificial goat. And that's what it can kind of feel like when you're feeling stabbed, <laughs> when you're feeling overwhelmed by the Ten of Swords. You have this idea of why must this happen? Why does this happen to me? And the idea of like a sacrificial animal is that it happens to you um, so that something better can come out of it. That sort of the purpose of a sacrificial animal is to appease the gods or to otherwise bring good luck where ultimately the benefits are going to outweigh the cost of the animal's life. I mean, obviously that's debatable, but that's sort of the concept behind a sacrificial animal. When you have sacrificed something or when you've, when you've given something up, when you have this, when you have a bad thing happen to you, ultimately it, something better can come from it and something better can come because of it in a way. Or in some ways you can see it as sort of the opposite of like, um, you need to protect against paranoia. I think I mentioned in the major about, um, we have always lived in the castle, which is one of my favorite books. And, um, it was written by Shirley Jackson, who also wrote the lottery. And in the lottery, you basically have this big, um, rural town that goes and stones people. They have a lottery to see who gets stones to be sacrificed to the corn god each or whatever it is, like the the harvest, yeah, sacrifice for the sake of the harvest each year. And so you could kind of see it that way as a sort of barbaric practice where sacrifice does not, you know, you can look at where are you sacrificing yourself where you don't need to? Where are you following this rather outdated practice of sacrificing yourself or or animal sacrifice where the payoff doesn't actually have anything to do with your sacrifice? Here we have the page. And you'll have to excuse me because I am not the best with bird uh, recognition. This is a magpie, according to the guidebook that I just checked here. And the magpie, <laughs> I think, is actually a really good choice because when I think of magpies, I think of um, looking for shiny things <laughs> and really being able to see through see through everything and pick out the gems among among the dirt. And I think that's sort of what curiosity is about, is you are looking for something until you find that shiny little Eureka. Aha! Here it is! Here's that one little shiny special piece of knowledge that makes it all worth it. You know, here's that cool fact. Here's that, here's this thing that I've learned that feels so rewarding. And so I, I really get that seeking um, idea of, from the magpie of like seeking for something among, among the chaff or whatever. Here you have a falcon or a hawk of some kind, some sort of predatory bird, which 
works very well. What I think is kind of interesting about this is that clearly the wind is against <laughs> the knight. You can see that just how dramatic this tree is falling in the back. This is an intense wind and the knight is undeterred. The knight is charging on ahead and you can see up here, maybe you can see it, up here you've got this other bird who is flying off with the wind and um, I think that speaks a little to the stubbornness of the Knight of Swords and the um, the steadfast like sticking to your your beliefs and sticking to uh, sticking to your knowledge. Anyway, I just I think that there's a lot you can gain from that. Here we have the Queen, a beautiful great horned owl, and they are up on this what is sort of implied to be a floating island, which I think is interesting that, again, you get this sort of um, bird's eye view, <laughs> I guess, of of everything. It speaks to this idea of a, of a balanced judgment, um, which I think is very inherent to the Queen of Swords. And you also get the fact that the owl is a predatory bird. It's a very wise bird, but ultimately it is not afraid to make the hard decisions and it is not afraid to go out and and get what it needs food if it recognizes that that's that's the best option and that's um that's what needs to be done and here i think this this to me looks like a golden eagle and again it's some sort of predatory falcon hawk eagle type thing i'm sorry king i just don't have all that much to say on to say on you. I feel like I covered it in the other ones. All right, here we are on the last suit. We have the Ace of Earth, or Pentacles, or Coins. I'll probably call it Pentacles. And this is sort of a goofy card, but I like it. You've got this big cow, this big bull, who is handing you this gold, and I sort of like it. It's sort of, it's sharing the wealth. It's giving you this seed money, when clearly this, um, you know, this bull is not hurting for cash. It's got these fucking leprechauns or whatever, which, you know, is a very classic idea of good luck and all that, all that sort of thing. I just think they're a little goofy. But, you know, you have a sort of generosity and, and this idea of support that's coming from other people. And this is almost like the ideal of what community support should look like, is giving everybody what they need to get going on what they what they want to do so that ultimately in the 10 spoiler alert <laughs> in the 10 you you are then the the wealthy one who can continue to pass on your um you know your wealth and when i'm saying wealth i don't just mean material wealth i mean a sort of wisdom also you can pass that on to the next generation so this is sort of like you're the young one you are receiving this wealth from the first generation or sorry, for not the first generation, but, you know, from the generation before you. Here we have the two, which is a butterfly. And that is sort of an interesting sense of balance to me, because the butterfly, it goes through these phases, right? It goes through the, from the caterpillar to the cocoon to the butterfly. And I don't know how, but that just kind of, to me, speaks of balance of knowing when the right time to do something is like knowing when it's the right time to do something knowing when it's like okay i've gotten all that i need i've gotten all that i can from these leaves so now i know it's the right time to move on to the next phase and so it it sort of speaks of balance in a very very broad sense of you're not trying to maintain a single thing you're it's just that overall you're maintaining stability by making adjustments from what you do. I guess I just see that as a sort of actionable balance, <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. Here we have the Three of Earth, which is a little family of robins, and I think that is an excellent selection of animal because I grew up in a place where you definitely have the robins who are making nests. We had robins making nests in our trees and on our uh, windows all the time in the summer. And so this definitely feels like this building of nests, uh, n building of nests 
And the fact that they're doing it here in the tree is very, very perfect. And I also like, I like this idea of supporting or of allowing yourself to be supported, where if you see yourself more as the child Robin, then you are allowing yourself to be supported by the wisdom of others and by the wisdom of, you know, presumably your parents, <laughs> you know, the wisdom of the older generation. So again, it's sort of going back to the thing I was mentioning in the Ace of like, it all has a very generational quality about it, which, which I like. Here you have the four. This is probably the minor that is the most uh, deviant from the Rider Waite Smith. In general, I see I like to see the four as a sort of protectiveness and a sort of um, greed, but not out of wanting to uh, accumulate more, but just out of wanting to protect what you have. I guess you'd call that um, being miserly or or cheap. They're putting the uh, coins into the hat, sort of, I could see that as trying to put them into, trying to protect them in a way. You're trying to put them into something so that they will be protected and so that you can come back to them later. But the thing about magic is that you're going to put them in the hat and then they're going to disappear, um, which I think is also a, a good um, foreshadowing, I guess, of the next card. And of course, the next card is the five, which this is a very classic rendition. Um, I like the armadillo because it feels like that is an animal that is very self-protective. And um, I, I think it's funny how you've got a little patch on the shell. I think that's you know, that speaks to really wanting to maintain your um, protection and and feeling vulnerable where even your your shell, the thing that you are so proud of and that makes you so strong, is starting to wear away. Um, anyway, I I mean, I really like these two as, as being next to each other. And even if I just pull up one of them, I'm, I'm often thinking with this particular deck, I'm thinking of the previous one or the next one. Here we have the six, and again, it's a rather classical Rider Waite Smith kind of rendition. I really like the scale, and I, I the scale is also in the Rider Waite Smith, I'm pretty sure. But I I always like the symbol of the scale in the six because it's it feels like a very good balanced give and take where you can see yourself as being the giver if you are in a position of. Um, wealth, or you can see yourself as being the receiver if you are in a position of need, but um, the point is that it's balanced either way. Sometimes you're on top, sometimes you're not, and it's um, it's sort of you are bringing balance to the, to the world here. I also like, again, this generational idea of you have these younger lambs who are you know, presumably they had fallen on hard times and their original seed money from the bull didn't work out the way they wanted to, but they can still receive wealth and they can try again and they can use what they've learned now to build something that's a little more lasting without um, feeling like they need to hide it away. And I, I'm going to mention this again because I think it's really important. When I'm saying wealth, I'm talking about knowledge as well as material wealth. Here we have the seven with a cute little mouse or rat. I guess it's probably a rat because of the ears. Um, and um, what I really like about this one is it's just one little plant. And so that feels, again, like the rebuilding and the restarting where you've taken this um, seed from the six and you are planting it. And then you have... You have one plant that is working well for you and that you've you've really worked hard on and you're looking at it and you're proud of it and you're like, yeah, this is good. I get a better sense of what I'm doing now. I know what I'm doing now. And then you can start to plant more so that eventually you will get the, the ultimate abundance that you're going to get in the Nine of Pentacles. 
Now we've got the Eight of Pentacles. It's, again, it's very classical. I always, always love the selection of a beaver for an animal deck for the uh, Eight of Pentacles, because I totally get the hardworking sense and the building sense and the mastery. That's what's interesting about beavers is that um, I always like animals that um, really make dramatic changes to their environment as as humans do, and um, beavers are very good at that. And if you've ever uh, seen a, uh, a diagram, I guess, of a beaver dam, it's very elaborate, where they have within the big structure, they have the water coming through, and then they also have their, uh, their homes. They have their burrows or nests or whatever you want to call it within that structure. It's very elaborate, and I, I just really like the selection of beaver. Okay, here we have the Nine of Pentacles, and what I like about this is that this squirrel is clearly very proud and very happy with this abundance and with all of the, the outcome of this hard work, but the squirrel is also contains the, uh, this potential with all of these acorns that are present on the robes and these acorns that are present in the tree up here. It sort of speaks to that never-ending cycle of growth of that, well, now I can take a moment and I can pause and I can be proud, and that doesn't mean it's over. There's always more to be done, um, and that doesn't need to be an overwhelming thing, is that you? it's good to take this time out to pause and be proud and simply enjoy the harvest and um, just because the cycle keeps going, that isn't a bad thing. That can be an encouraging thing. I just, I really, I really love acorns. I love eggs. I love seeds. I love anything that really speaks to the idea of potential, because I really feel like that's what tarot is about, is a sort of infinite, per perpetual potential <laughs> that, um, you know, there is no final point. There's no there's no ending point, there's no final destination that you're trying to reach, and and I think that is really nice. And it is a hard concept to accept, but I'm very happy that I have been working to try and accept that in my life, if that makes any sense. And here we have the ten, which again, it's sort of the conclusion of the generational story. Um, what I especially like up here is that you have the Scottish, um, or, or Celtic, um, plaid family crest, let's see, Mackenzie is what it says. And I really like that because it talks, it sort of is ancestral and it talks about previous generations work as having supported this current generation, which is now going to support the next generation. Um, and I, I really just like the depth and, again, the sort of cyclical nature of hearkening back and, and appreciating the efforts of your ancestors. I like that one. Here we have the page, which is a dog. This is a King Charles Spaniel. I honestly don't know if I personally would have chosen a dog for the Page of Pentacles. I do think that dogs are very curious, and I appreciate that as a page in general, and for the Page of Pentacles, I guess. So you, I guess you think of the dog as going out and and being very engaged with the material word, their worlds. They're sniffing things, and they are really engaging their senses, and they are taking everything in. All right, all right, I guess I can see where they're getting the dog from. Here you have the Knight of Pentacles. I like how they chose a very domestic animal. They chose this rooster that is a is a domesticated animal because I think that it speaks to the sort of tempering of the typically wild energy of the knight, but it's for the Knight of Pentacles, it's a little bit more level-headed and it's it's more practical and I think a domestic animal was a good choice for that. 
Now we have the Queen of Pentacles. This is a mountain lion, and this is a really stunning card. I love the nighttime setting um, because I feel like the pentacles, especially the pentacle courts, have a sort of coolness about them, but it's in a it's in a nice way. It's in an abundant way. It's not coolness in terms of coldness. It's coolness just in terms of um, feeling um, temperate. They feel very deep. I suppose I would call the, the Queen and King of Pentacles especially, I would call them deep. And I definitely get that sort of deep learned wisdom from the Mountain Lion I don't know why. And I guess because I I think of the mountains as being a very harsh environment, but a very um fruitful environment. They they have so much abundance. They have so many plants and so many species and there's so much going on in the forest. There's a lot going on everywhere, but the forest that that often especially reminds me of it. And so I guess just I get this idea of having learned to navigate all of that and having this um, this very earned wisdom, I guess, I really get from forest animals. Here for the king, our last card, oh my god, um, the king we have an emu, which I don't know all that much about emus. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the other aspects of it. I, I suppose I should research a little bit about emus, but one thing I like about it, you have this very tight grip, and there's this painting that this always reminds me of, and I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. I can't remember the title of it or anything. I guess I'll put that on the screen too when I inevitably find it, but it's a painting of one of the popes, I think, <laughs> in this um, red robe, and there's this green background, and... The Pope is holding the um, holding the the arm of the chair that he's sitting in very tightly and very intensely, but he has a very tired expression on his face and a very old weathered expression on his face. And so this tight grip in a chair will always remind me of that, um, where this emu looks like a very old creature. Um, especially being an adult emu that's paired with this child emu. Um, but it's not... Uh, I guess you'd say it as someone who has carried a lot of burdens, but has learned to do it well, and is learn has learned to carry it well, and has learned to really cement their position, and um, cement what they have. So... I guess I like the pose for that, and especially the fact that it's the red robe and the green background. It, it just reminds me of that painting a whole lot. Okay, <laughs> we are done. That was a very long video, and if you count the majors, that was a very long video. I did say this was going to be a deep dive, and deep dive it has been. If you have watched all of this, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. I hope to eventually do this with a couple other decks. And, you know, I really enjoy taking the time out to really get a good look at these cards and um, start noticing some symbols that I maybe never realized it before. I maybe never noticed before until I had to describe them to somebody else. So thank you very much for joining me. And I will see you next time. Bye.